What is a bee's favourite flower? This seemingly innocuous question might well save our wildlife and our food. These fields were once full of wildflowers throughout spring and summer. They supported a humming mass of honeybees and bumblebees. Here in the UK, of 270 bee species, 35 are threatened with extinction. Some are already sadly gone. Due to the rise of industrial agriculture and food production, along with urban expansion, we now face a situation where the very creatures that pollinate our fruits and vegetables can no longer perform that task. But thankfully, scientists and conservationists all over the world are acting now to help bees. We'll follow a team of scientists from across East Anglia, pioneering a new method to understand and help support them. What makes bees so special? People have been coming to master beekeeper and biologist John Everett to learn about bees for decades. And he's observed the huge diversity present in his own orchard in Norfolk, where he's been keeping hives for 45 years. We started having a lot of bees because we have a fruit orchard and we needed the bees to pollinate the flowers. If you don't pollinate the flowers, fertilization can't take place and then the fruit won't develop. All bees use pollen as their only source of protein that is needed for growth and development of young bees. But how does this feeding process result in the pollination of our favourite fruits and vegetables? A female bee, a worker, will go out and find a source of food, say some apple blossom, they'll get covered in pollen, they bring the pollen back to the hive, they go back again and the second time they might just take some pollen on the hair on the bodies and pollinate the flower that they're going to. Thankfully, through efforts by beekeepers like John, honeybees exist in great numbers in the UK. But many other wild bee species and other important pollinators are under threat. Dr Lynn Dix leads a team of scientists in Cambridge, looking to understand how wild bees use landscapes and respond to land management. From all of the studies that we've done on, on crop pollination, it looks like about half of the work is being done by honeybees and about half of it is being done by these wild insects. And you have a relatively small number of species that's doing most of that work. A few bumblebee species, which are very common in the, in, in the countryside, and five or six ground-nesting solitary bees, which are called andrina bees, are often found visiting crop flowers. Actually, three quarters of all the world's major food crops depend on pollination by animals to some extent. That's actually hundreds of billions of pounds a year globally, hundreds of millions of pounds a year just in the UK, which is um, added to the global economy by the activity of small pollinators. So if we didn't have any pollinators in the wider environment, we would still have food. We'd have plenty of starchy, sugary foods, and we'd have some fruits and some vegetables, but they wouldn't be so nice. Plants would be less productive, so they'd be less available, more expensive, harder to get. Next time you're eating a strawberry, think about the bees that were busy pollinating that flower earlier on in the year. It's only because of those bees that you have this really plump, juicy flesh on a strawberry. If we're going to help our pollinators, and our farmers, it is vital to understand what plants they pollinate. Ellie Kent is a PhD student from the University of East Anglia. She's working with Lynn Dix at the University of Cambridge, along with collaborators at the Earlham Institute, to trial a new method that uses DNA from pollen to trace what plants bees have been visiting. This process could transform what has historically been a time-consuming task. Two years ago I did some field work and I was looking at the pollen using the light microscope and I can definitely say it took a really long time to do and with some of the more closely related trees I couldn't tell which pollen was from which tree. More recently DNA sequencing methods have been developed which means that more people are able to do it, you don't need that level of expertise that looking at pollen under the microscope really requires. 
Each pollen grain collected by Ellie, though hard to identify by eye, has a unique code written in its DNA. By extracting the DNA from the pollen found on lots of bees, and then feeding that DNA into this machine called the minion, it's possible to identify all the different flowers any bee has been visiting, in real time. Darren Heavens and Richard Leggett are two of the scientists who've pioneered the use of the minion in identifying environmental DNA. The database of DNA sequences of all these wildflowers was generated here, in the Earlham Institute's state-of-the-art DNA sequencing laboratories. DNA is a, is a chain of molecules of, of four particular base pairs, and it's the order of those base pairs which are specific to any particular species. So this technology, the minions, are great because they can sequence really long stretches up to many millions of base pairs at a time. Two closely related species of, of plant may look very, very similar under a microscope, whereas with DNA, you get that specificity. And it's a real-time sequencer, which means that we get the results within seconds, rather than having to take a sample, go back to the lab, process it back in the lab, and then wait for the data. What we're trying to do is to break open the cells to release the DNA. We do that by mixing the, the pollen grains vigorously with some beads. As the beads collide, they break open the cells. That releases the DNA. We then capture that DNA, we wash it, so we can remove the cellular material we don't want, and then we quantify the DNA to see how much we've got, and also look to see how long those molecules are. Um, the longer they are, the easier it is to identify which species they belong to. The setup is quite a lot less expensive than other DNA sequencing techniques, so it could potentially be done by farmers, members of the public who are interested, um, scientists who don't have a lab set up. It's a lot more accessible. While Ellie and her colleagues are busy with their experiments, I'm catching up with another colleague from the Earlham Institute, Will Nash, who's been looking at the changing picture for bee populations by studying their genomes. We want to use this information to understand how pollinator populations have changed over the last 20 years. And for me, that means uh, when the weather's gorgeous like it is today, getting out and collecting specimens so that we can extract DNA from them. Can you tell us a bit about what's happened to uh, the natural landscape over the last 100 years or so? Uh, the human population has expanded greatly. And this has led to much more need for food and much more need for places to live. This means that landscapes are transitioning away from the diverse uh, mixture of habitats that they have been previously towards more homogenized monocultures which are less good for supporting biodiversity. And so how has that affected our pollinators? A large proportion of our pollinating species are reducing in their abundance. And if we see pollinator biodiversity degrade, the efficiency of pollination will be uh, affected and ultimately our agricultural system will be disrupted. This is our rainforest. This is uh, a place that anyone can go on safari in their back garden. We have to protect it. We have to conserve this, not only for agricultural purposes, but for the beauty of our whole ecosystem. Will takes me to a large willow tree, a beacon for bees in this landscape, to look for specimens. It's important to remember that um, pollinators aren't only bees. A uh, pollen source like this will draw in many flies as well, so hoverflies are a key pollinator, um, but also there's a huge diversity of flies as well. After my successful expedition with Will, I caught up with his colleague Callum Rain to find out how he uses Earlham's powerful supercomputers to complete the next stage in their work. The DNA from Will's bumblebee will be passed through the sequencing machine and then eventually arrive with me. But it doesn't arrive as a complete genome, unfortunately. It comes in tiny chunks that we have to piece back together again. It's very much like being given a book where all of the pages have been torn up and shuffled around. But we have several different methods we can do to, to get that genome that we need. So now we've got that information, that, that data, what's, what's the next step after that? We can begin comparisons between hundreds or even thousands of different samples from various populations, species, even different time periods. And in those comparisons, there are discoveries to be made. Uh, we can find populations presenting low diversity, which is a major risk factor, because it suggests that they might not have the tools in their gene pool that they might need if the environment changes. Or we can also look for areas of the genome that have recently adapted, which might suggest that something like pesticide usage or something has already had an impact on bumblebee evolution. 
we do detect an emerging problem like that, we can consult conservationists or policy makers. And of course, all in all, we're gaining a deeper understanding of fundamental biology and really learning how life works. But why are bees in so much danger? When my neighbours harvest their wheat and their barley, you end up with fields that are totally barren, total bee deserts. There are no plants there at all. There are no weeds. The crop flower is, is only flowering for a few weeks, and those bees are flying for a longer period than that. And also, they need a varied diet. They can't, just like us, they can't just survive on cheese or chips or, or, or sugar. They, they need uh, pollen from different sources, and that gives them the, that, that variety of food sources that makes for a nutritious diet for a bee. One of the answers to this would be to have set aside where farmers leave land um, to grow wildflowers, and let them flower before they cut them. So you haven't got a huge load of resource all at one time and then nothing, because the nothing will be disastrous for the bee, they'll have nothing to eat. They need to be able to find something else following on from the crop flower. Back in the orchard, the results are in from the Minion sequencer. So essentially the job of the, the software is, is to take the DNA sequences from the pollen to c compare it with the, uh, with the plants and to work out um, for, for each bit of sequence we've got from the pollen, what plant that relates to. Uh, so this is our software, Marty, that um, we've used to analyse the uh, sequencing data from the, from the bees' pollen. Um, so you can see here we've got a, um, a bunch of different bees, um, and I can click through on one of them uh, now, and we'll have a look at um, the pollen that it's collected. So, so this is showing one, one individual, and you can see here there's, there's four different species. Um, but, but here, the, the, by far the most dominant is a single species of, uh, of poppy that this particular bee has been visiting and collecting pollen from. These results are really helpful so we know where bees are foraging from in the landscape and which flowers they prefer to visit so that landowners and farmers can decide to plant more of those flowers around their farms and that will really support wild populations of bees. But does this mean a poppy is a bee's favourite flower? As with everything in science, the answer may not be that simple. So when you can see what pollens the bees have chosen from their environment, that tells you what, they, what they're using and what they like to eat, but it doesn't really tell you what they prefer, what they're actively selecting. What we've been doing with Ellie in my research group is trying to quantify the amount of flower resource of different plant species that are actually available to a colony of bees. You have to go out and map all the habitats and count all the flowers that are available to give you a landscape or a bee's eye view of the dining table that's available. And when we have that information, we can quantify to what extent these bees are actively choosing and preferring particular species over others, which will enable us to, to know what's most important to them nutritionally and in the landscape. So that's what scientists are doing to help bees. But what can we do at home? Dan Harris, founder of Bee Saver Behaviour, has a few tricks up his sleeve. Urban landscapes are this incredible patchwork of gardens. There are 15 million gardens across the UK. Together they add up to more land than all the nature reserves in the UK added together. There are all sorts of things that you can do really easy, some of them involving doing very little at all, that will help encourage bees and other pollinators to really thrive. So actually some of the simplest ones are, are things like leaving a corner of your garden unmown so there's longer grass for bees to shelter. Not pulling up the dandelions in your lawn is a really good one, especially in the spring. Um, and then actually, Bee hotels are something you can get from pretty much everywhere now, from supermarkets, garden centres, online. And actually a really good bee hotel is a great habitat for, for solitary bees to, to nest and grow their population in your area. The three things to think about when getting a bee hotel are, firstly, long nesting tubes, 15 centimetres is great. The second thing is a bee hotel that, that doesn't have too many other elements, so you don't really want pine cones because that just becomes a nesting place for the predators of bees. Um, and the third thing is how you install it. So install it a, at least a metre above the ground, um, on a south or southeast facing wall, and in a place where it's not going to swing about. Um, bees attach pollen and nectar to the little eggs, um, and if it swings about then the eggs become detached from that pollen and nectar. Having a garden full of bees is about having a vibrant garden, but it's also about that connection with nature. So I think they have value not only for food security, but also for us in terms of our well-being and our, our kind of relationship with the green space around us. Combined with the efforts of scientists and conservationists, your very own back garden efforts might well mark a turning point in the fortunes of bees. 
Although over the last 100 years or so, the amount of nectar available to wild pollinators has decreased by about a third. Since the 1970s, it's been creeping steadily back up again. Much of this is down to the flowers planted in people's gardens. A recent study showed in UK towns and cities that the amount of nectar per hectare is about the same as farmland and even natural reserves. So those bee hotels, along with urban gardens and freshly replanted wildflower meadows, might well go a long way to help. If science and conservation win out, in 20 years' time, we might be talking about the great return of our pollinators rather than their sad decline.